assessments are, I understand the test results reports. That, that's clear, right? I mean, if we're giving reports to people and they look at them and they're like, do I have this the right way up? <laughs> and they're turning it over and they're looking at it like, it just means about the same to me no matter how I look at it. Well, they obviously don't understand the test results reports and we're not doing a good job of delivering information, right? I mean, this is like delivering a newspaper in Chinese when the audience doesn't speak Chinese, right? So that's not good. Test results reports are based on data tempered with the proper amount of judgment and interpretation. Now this one is a little more subtle, but what I'm after here with this is I want, I, I don't want as an assessor looking at a test team, a situation where there's a lot of what I would refer to sarcastically as proof by assertion, right? Project, the test team or test lead or test member goes into his project status meeting and says, eh, product sucks. You know, why? Uh, I don't know, we just think it sucks. It has a lot of bugs, right? I mean, this is, that's proof by assertion. You're basically going in there and, and it's your opinion. You're making an assertion. You're daring people to disagree with you. In my experience with that is, is it's, it's at best very little value add. At worst, it's, it's extremely counterproductive and antagonistic and builds bad relationships uh, between developers and testers. So we should, we want to try to keep the opinion to the side and, and use data, but you also need to analyze that data. You need to provide some analysis and insight because the data is not always entirely self-explanatory. So that's what I mean by temper with a proper amount of judgment and interpretation. That the opinion of the stakeholders is that you are helping them interpret and understand the information, but you are not cramming your opinion down their throat. Okay? And then the last is test results reports include the information that I need to guide the project to success. You know, ultimately, you, get, you can give people information they can understand, and you can give people information in a way that they perceive as, as balanced and, and neutral, and that's good. But if it's not information that they need, you fail, right, in terms of the, the information delivery. So you really want the, the reaction to be strongly agree to all three of these things. I understand it, I accept that it is a balanced presentation, and I can use the information to make smart decisions. Anytime you identify a situation where somebody, one of one or more of the stakeholders is saying they're neutral or they disagree or God forbid they strongly disagree with one or more of these statements, um, you have an opportunity to improve your test dashboard, your test results, and one that the more negative the impression is, the more urgent that opportunity is, the more you want to you want to get on top of that. Okay, now, so some people, when I say risk-based results reporting, they say, well, you know, okay, I, I understand every single word that you just said, but I, I'm having difficulty visualizing what that would look like. So let me give you an example of this. Um, this is explained, this, this graph is explained in a lot more detail in uh, my book, Advanced Software Testing Volume 2. I talk about uh, results reporting, and it's also going to be in an upcoming webinar on test results reporting. I think it's in December, but it might be November. Uh, anyway, this is, this is a way of boiling down your results to one nice tight little pie chart. Um, Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to try to measure what the residual level of risk is. And we're going to say, you know, we can classify the risks into three buckets. The green bucket is the risks for which every test that is scheduled to be run has been run, and they've all passed. And there are no known must-fix bugs associated with those risks. So that's the green wedge here, okay? The red wedge says, okay, these are the risks where we've run some of the tests, maybe not all of them, maybe just some of them, but maybe all of them. But we've run some tests, and at least one of those tests has failed, or there's some other must-fix bug that's known associated with that risk. And notice that I'm talking about associated with the risk, so there's the element of traceability coming up here, right? need to be able to trace my test cases, test case results, bug reports back to the risk items in order to be able to do this. Yeah. So the, the coloring scheme is fairly obvious, right? Green means these, these risks are in the green. We're good to go on these things. It, 
So to the extent that these needed to be tested, we've tested them, there aren't any problems. The red risks are, we've done some testing here, we know there are problems. Now the black risks are the ones where we're still in the dark. And the black risks are basically all the other risks. And what that means is there are, there are no known must-fix bugs and there are no known, must, no known fit test failures associated with these risks, but there are still tests left to be run, right? So if we finish running a risk, all the tests for a risk item that's in the black wedge and all those tests pass, then that area of the wedge associated with that risk goes into the green wedge. If we're running the tests related to a risk in the black wedge and one or more of those tests fail, or we find some other must-fix bug associated with the risk, it goes into the red wedge. Now, as, as time goes along, this is the time of the test execution period here moving along the bottom. As time goes along, we would hope that the, the picture would become like the one on the right, where the green has basically driven out the red and the black, right? Um, and basically that's saying, you know, most of the risks are in the green zone. Now, you say, oh, well, then the project doesn't end until everything's green. Well, it could be, but really what you can do is you can go to management with two lists, a black list and a red list. The red list are those risks that have a known must-fix bug and or a known failed test, right? And you can tell them, these are the risks, these are the bugs, these are the tests that have failed. The black list is, these are the risks and here are the tests that we haven't run yet. As soon as management is comfortable with the red list and the black list, in other words, they say, you know what, we can accept these risks and go live with these risks. These are acceptable risks. Then you're done. Right? And so that's what I'm talking about, results reporting that enables smart decision making and risk-based results reporting. That's what I'm talking about. We're, we're able to communicate to management in a language that they understand. Okay, so why are clear objectives a best practice? What are the benefits? Well, clear objectives provide a clear definition of success for the test process and the test team. It's not opinion, it's not reacting to the latest adventure or whatever crisis might have broken out. It's, it's a fact-based way of measuring goodness of testing. It will give us guidance in terms of areas of process improvement that might be required. Right. If we are underperforming in one or more key objectives, we know that's where we need to focus our process improvement. And it um, helps us have uniform and realistic expectations across the different test stakeholders. So we've got agreement, negotiated, these are the objectives, these are the metrics, these are the targets for those metrics. There's just, there's no confusion, right? Okay, which leads us to the next thing, which is continuous test process improvement. This is the next, the next best practice that I wanted to talk about. So here what we would do is we would have our, our internal and external test objectives. And we would say, okay, we've got these objectives, we've got metrics, we've got targets for them. We want to move that metric in a direction that we would consider good in terms of effectiveness or efficiency become more effective, more efficient, or both. So we would put a plan in place to, to do this, right? You'd, you'd look at the metric and you'd say, okay, I want to move the needle this way, and so I'm going to put this plan in place. So now when you start talking about project process improvement plans, you're, you're in the realm of standard total quality management TQM techniques, right? Pareto analysis to identify the factors that are most influential, five wise techniques or Ishikawa diagrams to identify what are the things that underlie those factors, how do I get at the real root causes so that I can start to make some changes, scatter plots to, to look for demonstrable correlation between something that you think should change and what you're trying to affect, you know, so that's fairly typical process improvement stuff. And um, now here's something that's a little bit unique when we're talking about test process improvement. We have to be conscious of the fact that some of the factors that are going to affect the test process are going to be outside of the test process because testing is downstream of a lot of other stuff, right? So um, 